This is a Hot Pie Media Original. So, you know, my concern, my biggest concern is that we're equating getting the job done with doing the job effectively. Um, and I think those are different things. And I think what, what we're discovering with remote work is we can get the job done. We can work remotely. I mean, it's working, we're getting it done and everything is fine, but um, I don't know what kind of value we might be leaving on the table. Now that might be, so there's a long answer, that might be a calculation that a lot of organizations are willing to live with. Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Eric Corum, founder of AIM7, and this is The Blueprint. I've spent my entire life helping Olympic gold medalists, NFL, and NCAA athletes be the best at their craft. Now I'm taking that experience and translating it into your life. This podcast is for busy professionals and household CEOs who care deeply about their family, career, and their health. There's an ocean of content to wade through, but I do the heavy lifting for you and still cutting edge science, leadership, and life skills into simple tactics optimized for your busy lifestyle and goals. Today, I'm joined by Todd Henry. Todd is an author and internationally sought after speaker on the topics of creativity, productivity, and developing a passion for work. As Todd says, he's an arms dealer for the creative revolution. On today's episode, we discuss the practices you need to engage in to be creative when it matters most, and the three assassins stealing your creativity. This was a ton of fun for me and really fulfilling as I read of one of Todd's books, The Accidental Creative, about eight years ago, and it had a really big impact on me, and it's been a desire of mine to have him on the show, so this was a lot of fun. But right now, would you please take one moment and hit the subscribe button on whichever listening platform you're joining us from, as this is one of the best ways that you can support the podcast. But now it's time to lean in and learn from the best. Todd, I think you would agree that in general, we have moved to a knowledge worker economy and our ability to create it for a lot of us is our livelihood. Um, you say that in order to be creative, to be a creative asset to your team, that you need to be prolific, brilliant, and healthy. How do we, how do we be prolific on demand? How does that work? Well, the, the, to get right to the punchline, right? The dirty little secret is if you want to be brilliant at the moment's notice, you have to begin far upstream from the moment you need a brilliant idea. And the way you do that is by building practices into your life to sustain your creative ambitions. You see, many of us have creative ambitions, you know, we have things we want to do, projects we want to create, uh, businesses we want to start, um, you know, promotions that we want to get, right? We have all these ambitions, but we're not willing to build the infrastructure necessary to get us there. Anything great that we want to do in any aspect of life requires infrastructure. Without the infrastructure, you're not going to accomplish the results you want, or it's going to be uh, a tenuous result at best. So, If you want to be brilliant when it matters most, you have to begin by building practices in your life that prepare you for those moments when you need to be brilliant so that you're, uh, you have all of the resources, you have the the ability to focus that you need, you have a clear understanding of what you're trying to do, you have uh, the time built into your life to connect dots to synthesize all of those things. So um, that is what I find among creative pros who seem to be prolific, brilliant, and healthy, uh, all at the same time. So some of the practice, I, I 100% agree. Like if you, if you want to train for anything, my background is in human performance. You don't just show up and win the Olympics. Right. It's, it, it starts four years in advance, if not 15 years in advance. And you build the, the capacity to do the thing that you want to do. You have an acronym that I really like fresh focus, relationships, energy, stimuli, and hours. Can you break that down for our audience? Sure. Yeah. So these are really the five common areas as I researched. uh, Well, first of all, I spent a lot of time leading teams of creative people. And I I noticed that some people on my team were especially resilient in the face of pressure and other people seemed to struggle when under pressure. And what I discovered was that the people who seemed to be especially resilient had a set of practices, as I mentioned in their life, but they seem to have practices in these five areas. Um, Focus, they had the ability to step back and understand how to allocate their finite attention effectively. And they were also able to enter into 
a mode of work that allowed them to deeply focus on what they were doing and not be distracted by the world around them. So they had specific practices to, to enable them to facilitate them to do that. Um, the second area was relationships. You know, we tend to think that creativity is a solo sport that, you know, basically somebody in a cabin in the middle of Montana is inventing the next iPad and they're going to come out and say, ta-da, here it is, the next great invention. But that's not how creativity and innovation works. Creativity and especially innovation is groups of people stumbling awkwardly into the unknown together, right? Sharing pieces of their insight with each other. So if we want to be effective, we need to have strong, effective relationships. And that's why I discovered in the lives of prolific, brilliant, healthy creatives is that they had networks of people that they leveraged in the course of their work, um, that they learned from, that they were challenged by, uh, that they gave great insight and purview into their own life and work in such a way that they were able to receive feedback that helped them get better at what they do. Um, the third Before part of- we move the- on to energy. Oh, yeah. I want to double click on this for a second. Since the pandemic has begun, mm-hmm. relationships have had a barrier, you know, especially at the very beginning. Right. How have you seen that impact creativity? Have you seen there in a ripple effect on this at all? So I have. Um, the the biggest way that I've seen it impact organizations, especially, is you know when we're not in the same room breathing the same air, which is what we've been trying to avoid uh, for the last couple of years. Um, we can communicate with our words. We can communicate with our our text. Right. We can we can type things back and forth to each other. But we miss some of the nuance, um, some of the environmental nuance that we capture when even even subconsciously capture when we're in the same room together. So what I've discovered is that we, you know, people individually are still able to come up with ideas and share those ideas. But the synthesis of the group's idea machine is not as strong because we're not in the same room. We're not having those casual conversations. We're not sparking one another. Um, It's sort of that cultural creativity that's really, really struggling right now in a lot of organizations. And, you know, we can coast for a while. And I think we are, I think we're, we're, and many organizations are running on creative fumes right now, you know, uh, in some ways, but the idea that we're going to be able to forever work remotely and equal the creative output of groups of people in rooms together um, for long periods of time, having casual and formal conversations, I think is um, it's yet to be seen. Maybe we can, maybe we can figure that out, but it's not the same, you know, like right now we're having a conversation, but I'm not looking at you. I'm looking into a camera lens, right? right? Uh, I'm not capturing your facial expressions. I'm not, you know, seeing how you're sitting right now. I don't even know if you're wearing pants right now. I hope you <laughs> I am. Uh, you know, just for those I interested. Am, yeah, yeah. Be clear. Um, but you know, I mean there's just this sort of um intimacy that we lose when we're not together, when we're not in the same room. And that intimacy and that empathy is important for our ability to problem solve, to empathize, to to um, synthesize in a way that is not just convenient and that maybe gets the job done, but that actually meets the needs of the people we're trying to solve problems for. Um, so, you know, my concern, my biggest concern is that we're equating getting the job done with doing the job effectively. Um, and I think those are different things. And I think what, what we're discovering with remote work is we can get the job done. We can work remotely. I mean, it's working, we're getting it done and everything is fine, but um, I don't know what kind of value we might be leaving on the table. Now that might be, so there's a long answer. That might be a calculation that a lot of organizations are willing to live with, you know, Hey, we're saving a lot of money. We have a greater access to a more diverse talent pool geographically and otherwise. Um, so it's worth it to us to, leave some of that value on the table to gain some of the other benefits. But I'm just talking in terms of pure creativity, pure innovation. I think it, it's very different when we're not in the same room, breathing the same air. hundred percent. I appreciate you going into that because it's something that's top of mind for me. I have a startup and yes, I could access greater talent, but there's a connectivity. You know, at first there were some people I was working with that wanted to have their, their camera off. And I was like, no, 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 no. Yeah. We're going to talk to each other. And my friend, Dr. Michael Platt at Wharton, he's the head of neuroscience there. 
Um, he's he has some really cool research on just even the angle of the camera lens and how it impacts our ability to connect. And so, like when these people have these really weird, you know, coming at the right cheek kind of stuff, it's yeah. like they may not, they may have really good intentions, but it just feels weird and it's kind of hard to connect with the top of someone's forehead. Yeah. And you can't see yeah. their body language. And so I, like you, am very interested to see how this plays out. I have my own hypothesis, but um, I'll leave it to the experts like you. So let's get Well, back. I think also there's, there's another sort of, so I'm working on a framework, something I'm calling the empathy crisis, right? Because I think it's so important for creativity and, and especially for leadership. Because I spend a lot of time working with leaders and teaching leaders how to lead creative people effectively. And part of the framework is when we have visibility without relationship, right? So when we have visibility into somebody's life, like think social media, um, but we don't have a relationship with that person. What do, what do we call that? What do we call it when somebody is spying on someone else? We call it voyeurism, right? And I think a lot of our relationships today are somewhat voyeuristic. We, we have information about people and we can see people, but we don't really know those people. We don't have the responsibility of relationship with them. Part of what makes teams work is the ebb and flow and the tussle that happens when you have to deal with somebody's idiosyncrasies or when you have to um, deal with conflict in a direct way. You can't just click a button and end the meeting. Like you have to actually deal with that conflict because you're in the same space, right? Um, I feel like there's a kind of plastic. Um, it's almost like we have like a sheet of clear plastic between us when what well, we do, you know, when we're when we're talking to each other virtually that I think impedes our ability to really understand what's going on and, and really have meaningful conversations. And, and so I think f for me, that's my biggest concern. It's not, can we get the work done? It's that we are stymieing progress culturally um, as a team. We're stymieing progress in terms of our, our ability to, to think and innovate and really get to the next um, place of value organizationally. So I think we have to be very careful about what we do next. I'm a hundred percent with you. I really appreciate you sharing that with us. Visibility without relationship is voyeurism. That is, that's some pretty, that's some pretty deep stuff. So back on to our fresh and that acronym, we're about to hit energy, I think, right? Yes. Yeah. So energy. So we're great at managing our time and we are, like we have more tools in at any point in human history for managing time. What we're terrible at is managing our energy. So we can stack meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting. We get to the end of the day. We need a brilliant idea. We got nothing left in the tank because we haven't been managing our energy. Um, we tend to think if we can physically say yes to something because there's time available, then we should say yes to it. But that's not the way our body functions. We have a finite amount of energy to spend on behalf of things that matter to us. So what we need to be good at is something that I call pruning, uh, well, a lot of people call it pruning, but I specifically apply it in this context, which means we have to be really good at saying no sometimes to really good things so that something better can be born. Um, we and organizations especially are really good at adding things and we're not good at taking things away. So we have to be really good at saying no, uh, making decisions so that we can say yes to more important things. Um, the next letter is S, which is for stimulus. These are all of the dots that we connect in order to generate ideas. Creativity is not born out of nothing. It's born in a context. And that context is all of our experiences, all of the other problems we've solved, all of the other insights we've had. Creativity is, as Steve Jobs said, creativity is just connecting things. It's connecting dots and playing with ideas until something clicks together that is novel and useful in some way. Um, Steven Johnson called this pursuing the adjacent possible, right? Borrowing a term from evolutionary biology. We play with ideas in the immediate adjacent possible, combine them, experiment with them until we find something that works. And that's how we come up with new ideas. Um, but to do that, we have to be intentional about the stimulus that we build into our life. So what I found is productive, creative professionals tend to have rituals or practices around filling their mind with valuable stimulus. It could be that they, uh, you know, root, have a routine of absorbing the great work of people they admire. It could be that they go out and put themselves in situations where they experience the world in new ways. Uh, but whatever it is, they had some 
regimen of absorbing stimulus. They weren't just kind of shooting from the hip. You know, they were filling their well so that they had something to draw from. I want to take just a moment to fill you in on the app I've been building for the past 18 months. We're still in private beta, which means we only let in a select number of people each month. And I don't want you to miss out on your chance to start our program for free while you still can. AIM7 is a health and fitness app that turns your wearable data into personalized exercise recommendations that layer on top of popular exercise programs that you already love to do, like Apple Fitness Plus and Peloton. These recommendations prevent burnout and improve long-term fitness. Then AIM7 picks up where wearables fail you, and we actually identify and teach you how to fix your most pressing wellness issues, such as improving sleep and energy and reducing stress. To get early access to this exclusive program, go to www.aim7.com, that's A-I-M-7.com, and sign up now. There are limited spots available each month, so sign up now and reserve yours. Now, back to the show. The final letter is H, which is for hours. Um, Originally, by the way, this was time. And my editor said, right now you have frest and frest is not good. <laughs> time to hours. I'm like, okay, great. Um, you know, we are really good, as I mentioned earlier about planning our time, but we often think of our time in terms of efficiency, not in terms of effectiveness. So I like to couch it in the context of, for example, how we think about money, you know, uh, you need some money to spend for sure. But if you're really smart, you're also investing some of your money in a vehicle that's going to maybe not show you an immediate return, but will show you a return over time. Um, There's a little bit of risk involved when you do that, of course, with your money. Well, the same thing applies to your time. We often spend our time on things that are urgent, that matter now, but we very rarely invest our time in activities that may not have an immediate payoff, but may pay off later. Things like... Um, spending time to do nothing but come up with ideas for our projects. That feels very wasteful when you get to the end of an hour and you have nothing to show for it, right? So that's why we don't do it. But that's an investment of time in something that matters. Things like developing our skills, things like engaging in what I call back burner creating, or in the Axon Creative, I called it unnecessary creating. I stopped calling it that because it is actually necessary. Um, But back burner creating means doing work that nobody's paying you for, nobody's judging, nobody's you know, asking you for, but you're doing it as a way to experiment with ideas, develop your skills, try new things, et cetera. So we need to have some way in our life of investing our time in things that will help us um, potentially have a a future return uh, on that investment. So focus, relationships, energy, stimuli, hours. Um, I went through that really fast. Sorry, but we might've actually time traveled. I'm not sure. You uh, you did a phenomenal job and this is such a great thing for people that are uh, that are trying to create and like you said like you can't just come up with a brilliant idea there has to be training involved and uh this is to me is an an excellent framework for that and i've been you know somebody that's a first time founder it, i have to create these windows number 1 i know that urgent things are going to come up but if i don't have a window then it's going to create undue stress but also like i need to be able to sit there and turn over thoughts and problems look at a situation and just turn it over in my head and when i can do that then it usually leads me down a path where i can actually build something that's 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 interesting it's new you know um mm-hmm. You also said that there's three assassins to creativity. I love this. Like I think of like Assassin's Creed when you say this. I'm not a video gamer, but I just have that. Can you talk about those assassins? Yeah. Uh, so these are the the hurdles that get in the way of our ability to create. And by the way, I find them in the life of every creative pro and I find them in every organization. It's funny when I give talks about the accidental creative, um, often when I'm when I get to this part, it's people's eyes are as big as dinner plates. Cause they're just like this. You're describing my life. Do you have cameras on the wall of our office? How, how did you know this? I'm like, well, these are just, they're endemic, you know, to the creative process. So the first assassin is dissonance. So dissonance is a term that's used in a lot of contexts. For example, it's used to describe two notes that don't quite go together. You know, so you have dun, dun, brr, it creates kind of a tension. When you hear a dissonant chord, it makes you feel uneasy. Like something's not quite right because our minds are wired to crave harmony, to crave consonants. Um, dissonance makes us feel uneasy. That's why, by the way, if you hear an animal in trouble, 
they typically don't, you know, sing a beautiful melody. They typically make a shriek that makes you feel sort of like, ah, if you ever hear like an animal that's in trouble, they'll shriek or they'll growl or they'll do something in a really dissonant way. It's designed to make the their predator feel uneasy, feel scared, you know? Um, so dissonance in the creative context is when there's a gap between what you're doing and why you're doing it. It's kind of a cognitive dissonance between what I'm doing and the deeper understanding I have of why I'm doing it. And I don't mean your existential why, like, why am I here on this planet? I mean, literally, why are we doing this project? What is the desired outcome? Um, when we lack that as a creative firm, this happens, by the way, in a lot of organizations where we're told to do something, but we don't really understand how that puzzle piece fits into the bigger puzzle that we're yeah, trying. And so what do we do? Well, we just play it safe. We stay within the lines. We make sure we don't do anything that's going to, you know, cause any problems down the road. We don't, we, it's hard for a talented creative pro to give their full effort when there's a misalignment between the why and the what or a misunderstanding. So there are a couple of sources of dissonance. The first one is what I call the opacity phenomenon, which is when somebody in a black box, you know, makes all the why based decisions. And then they come out and say, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. And they go back in the black box. Everybody's left saying, why are we doing this again? And as a creative pro, it's our job to seek out the why behind the what, Hey, I want to do a great job here. Help me understand why this project matters. Help me understand why I'm being asked to do this, because I might think of things I wouldn't have thought of otherwise, if I understand why I'm doing it to begin with. Um, a second source of dissonance is what I call unnecessary complexity which is when, you know, we add so many layers of complexity in the organization or in our processes, or even in terms of how we personally think about the problem, that we lose sight of why we're doing it to begin with. We have to jump so many hurdles just to get to the work because we've made it so complex that we lose sight of why it is we're even doing it. So just getting through the hurdle starts to feel like an accomplishment, right? Um, which is a problem. And then the, the, the other source of dissonance is a lack of clear edges. When we don't define the work effectively, we don't know what we're really trying to do, then it's hard to know when we've accomplished it. So a lot of people work right up until they run out of time or run out of money because you know, that's how they, well, okay, we're done because we've run out of time or run out of money. Well, that's not any way to work, right? Um, so if we lack a clear definition of the work, it's difficult for us to understand uh, why we're doing it. So that's dissonance. That's the first assassin. The second one is fear. Fear is when the perceived consequences of failure outweigh the perceived benefits of success. So we don't act. We don't take little strategic risks in the course of our work. We artificially escalate the perceived consequences of failure uh, to the point that we become paralyzed. Uh, any little risk starts to feel like too much risk. And that can sound maybe a little dramatic when I say it that way. It's but not. But if people don't know the why and the what, yes. and those aren't aligned, you're going to be afraid. That's right. You're yeah. going to experience it. And that's, that's, what's interesting is people have multiple times when I've led, I've either given a talk on this and I'm you know, sort of doing at the end, just kind of meeting people after a meet and greet or something. So many people have said all three of these assassins are like a giant circle. You know, they all sort of run in and, and they totally do. Absolutely. Um, there's no question. So, you know, when, when you are, when you are experiencing fear, fear of failure, um, you know, Voices start whispering in your ear, become confusing, and then you experience dissonance, right? So it's it's not like these are discrete. I mean, they definitely interact with one another for sure. Um, so the, the question that I usually challenge people with uh, for dissonance specifically is, is there anything that you're doing right now that you don't have a clear and compelling understanding of the why behind it, right? For fear, it's, is there any place in your life or in your work where you're afraid to take strategic risk, where you feel like you're shrinking back, where you're not extending yourself? Because the reality is, if you're not occasionally failing, you're probably not trying sufficiently difficult work. Um, and listen, we don't want to fail. Nobody wants to fail. But you should, at some point, get to the edge of your ability if you're really working up your potential. You should occasionally fail. Now, maybe that doesn't mean failing in the grand sense, like my business went under or we lost the client. That's not what I mean. But what I mean is, like, if you're not in the process, if you're not failing occasionally, like, oh, I tried to do something and it didn't work, uh, so we had to adapt and iterate and do something different, that's not happening to you every so often you're not really trying hard enough, right? That's how the brain um, works too. That's how neuroplasticity operates. If you're not training on the edge of your ability, you can't see plastic changes. And so, you, you know, these, this is so interesting because this is fundamentally how our biological systems adapt and stress yeah. has to be a part of that process. Sorry, go ahead. 
No, yeah, that's absolutely right. And and also, by the way, how do you grow creatively in your creative capacity? You try, you fail, you learn, you adapt, you try again, right? Like that's how you grow your creative capacity. And it's the same as growing muscle or like you said, developing your mind or any of those things. It's baked into the rules of nature. That's how things work. That's how we adapt. Um, And then the final assassin is expectation escalation, which is when we become paralyzed because we're comparing our in-process work with the absolute best thing that's ever been done ever in the history of humanity in our field, which happens, right? So, you know, I'm working on a book, I'm writing and I'm thinking, ah, this isn't, this really isn't measuring up to my previous books. Maybe I should just, you know, maybe this isn't the right project or maybe it's just not good enough or it's never going to get there or whatever. We fail to realize, I mean, I, I make it a routine when I'm writing a book, actually, I do this pretty often when I'm writing a book or when I get like in between when I turn the draft in and when I get it back from my editor, I'll go back and read the first drafts of some of my other books and compare them with the finished draft after the edited draft. I'm a terrible writer. I'm just going to say that right there. <laughs> I am not a good writer, right? Um, well, actually, let me let me amend that. A good writer is one that recognizes how to make their work better. So I, I, in that sense, I'll say, okay, I am a good writer, but it just takes me like three or four drafts to get there, you know, to being, which it takes every writer three or four drafts to get to a good product. But we want to compare our in process work with the absolute best finished product of the people we admire. And that's just not a fair comparison, right? Like if I'm a musician and I'm working on a, on a song and I'm comparing it to like, you know, Sergeant Pepper, I mean, come on, you know, that's, you know, it's, it's an unfair comparison. Now it's good to strive, but we have to be careful not to become paralyzed by that uh, and allow that to affect our creative process. Todd, this has been phenomenal. I, we got a couple minutes left. I want to know two things. One, what has got you excited and where are your creative juices going right now? Yeah, this is going to sound a little, maybe a little bit, uh, like a very personal thing for me, but, um, you know, for the longest time for several years now, I, I, I travel and I speak and I do workshops and I, I speak at conferences and, and train companies. And so that's primarily what I've been doing. Right. So for the longest time I have shunned virtual presentations, um, because I thought like, well, you know, I mean, I want to be in the room with people. Like it's not, you know, it's not the same if you're not, um, I have come not only to like begrudgingly accept virtual presentations, but actually have kind of fallen in love with doing virtual presentations um, because I can present to a group in Manila, Philippines and a group in, you know, Chicago, Illinois in the same day, which I could never do before. So Mm -hmm. it's just exciting to me now that so many doors have opened to be able to train and teach companies from all over the world. So um, I've had to get really creative, um, you know, like basically turn my office into a production studio, which you're not seeing right now as we're doing this, but like, you know, multiple cameras and multiple microphones and multiple everything to be able to in full production suite to be able to do these presentations. And I absolutely have fallen in love with that process. So um, that's a great example of how constraints yield innovation. Right. Um, I didn't want to do it, but because I was constrained, I had to do it and figure it out. And I discovered I actually really found some love, some deep love for that. So I'm I'm very excited about that. I'm also, though, by the way, really excited to get back in the room with people again. Um, I have a handful of uh in-person training and speaking events on the calendar, and I'm really excited about that. I've done a couple over the last couple of years. Um, and every time I do it, I'm like, oh. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's great to be in the same room with people. Um, the energy, and especially I can imagine in a small group where you get really tactical, you right. can really add some value. So if people want to learn more about you, buy your books, or even book you for a, an engagement, where should they go? Yeah. So so if um, I'll give you a couple of places. My personal site is toddhenry.com. Uh, and there you can learn about my speaking and my books and all of that. Um, if you're interested in my podcast, which has uh, been around since 2005, um, awesome, started, by the way. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, we've been doing, doing it weekly since 2005, which is kind of crazy to think about. Um, that's at accidentalcreative.com. Um, you can find that. And there's also a free course there and some other stuff that you can explore at accidentalcreative.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. This is like a fulfillment for me in a lot of ways because I read your book so many years ago. I loved it. You have you have several other books that are, are world class, and I just am really appreciative of having you on. And thanks for joining me. Yeah, thank you so much. 
If you enjoyed today's episode, I suggest that you check out episode number 60 with Steve Magnus, the author of The Passion Paradox. Steve and I discuss how you can pursue your passions without burning out, developing mastery, and the myth of mental toughness. Thanks for joining us, and I'll see you soon. Thanks for listening. You can find more episodes and all of our other Hot Pie Media originals baked fresh daily at our home online at hotpiemedia.com, the Hot Pie Media YouTube channel, or wherever you listen to podcasts.